Bible reading is from Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 1 to 22. Nehemiah's final reforms. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of people, and there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted to the assembly of God because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded, excluded from Israel all who were foreign of foreign descent. Before this, Elizabeth Hib, the priest, had put in charge the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and the incense and the temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians, and gatekeepers, as well as contributions to the priest. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I returned to the king. Some time later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliza Hib had done in providing Tobiah with a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms and then put them into the, put them, sorry, I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the office, offi officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called to them, called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shelemiah, the priest, Zadok the scribe and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms, and made Hannah, son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, their assistant, because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for dis disputing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done in the house of my God and its services. In those days, I saw in Judah treading people treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs and all other loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who live in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this wicked thing you are doing? Desecrating the, sab desecrating the Sabbath. Didn't your ancestors do the same things so that our God brought all this calamity on us and this city? And now you are stirring 
up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When the evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, why do you spend, all, spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I, I commanded the Levites to purify, purify their, themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Cynthia. As we come to God's word, let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word. And we ask that it may always be in our minds, on our lips, and in our hearts. Amen. So since the start of September, we've been exploring together the Old Testament books of Ezra and Nehemiah. These books originally written as one unified story, a set after the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and its temple and took many of its people away with them into exile. They tell the story of how the Israelites were allowed to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city and their lives there. And what we've been trying to do, therefore, is to stand amid our own circumstances of returning and rebuilding post-pandemic and attempt to listen as attentively as possible to the living and active Word of God. What might the experience of God's people who have returned from exile in, from Babylon two and a half thousand years ago have to say to us here and now as we return from a diff very different kind of exile in a very different kind of con cultural context? And therefore, before we dive into the meat of Nehemiah 13, I want to just take a little bit of time to recap the story as a whole and to make sure that we don't miss the forest for the trees. So there's a common pattern that runs through Ezra and Nehemiah. First, a Persian king is moved by God to send a leader to Jerusalem. So Cyrus sends Zerubbabel to rebuild the temple. Then Artaxerxes sends Ezra to teach God's law and rebuild the community. And later he sends Nehemiah to repair the city walls. The second, the leader encounters opposition to their part in the rebuilding, both from within and from without. And third, there seems to be some kind of spiritual renewal whether the dedication of the second temple, which we saw in Ezra, or a corporate confession of sin and recommitment to God's law, which we've been looking at for the past couple of weeks, which are in chapters 8 to 12 of Nehemiah. But as we see from today's reading, that renewal doesn't last long. The renewal actually rather fizzles out. The initial enthusiasm wanes, the people's commitments are forgotten, and the prophetic hopes for life after exile, for a future messianic king, for God's presence in a new temple, for God's kingdom to be established among the nations, all of those remain hanging. The initial hopes eventually turn to disappointment. The book of Ezra finishes with Ezra tearing out his hair and despair at the people's unfaithfulness. We didn't read quite this far, but if you've got your Bible open, take a look at verse 25, because it says, I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. Verse 
So by the end of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is pulling out the people's hair, let alone his own. Now, I don't think that's a model for us in the church. I'm just going to say that now. And the last words of Nehemiah, again, if you've got your Bible open, have a look. The last words, remember me with favor, my God. In other words, oh God, at least I tried, right? And so instead of finishing with the words, and they all lived happily ever after, Ezra Nehemiah ends in anticlimax. After we've, what we've looked at over the past couple of weeks with the people enjoying a seven-day marathon of Bible reading and teaching, engaging in a corporate confession of sin and recommitting themselves to the terms of the covenant with God, we dare to dream that this is going to be the turning point of the story. But it's not. Nehemiah, it seems, turns, uh, heads back to Persia on a business trip, only to return and discover that the whole return and rebuild agenda is unravelling before his eyes. The newly rebuilt temple is being neglected and defiled. God's law is being ignored symbolized by the fact that the people are dishonoring the Sabbath by carrying on their work as normal. And where do they do it? Right by those shiny new city walls. The three things that were to be repaired, that were to be rebuilt, the temple, God's law, the city walls, all three of them compromised. And what's more, the problem of compromised marriages from Ezra's day, we read in that if you carry on uh, from verse 23 onwards, all of that gets worse too. And so all of this raises the question, what's the point? What purpose are these books driving at? What message are they trying to communicate And that then is what we're going to be thinking about today. Is the storyline of Ezra and Nehemiah just an exercise in futility? Does the work of the leaders like Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah really just finish with a shrug of the shoulders? and I did my best. Well, certainly leadership can often feel like that. Uh, You can look back on what you've tried to do and think, what have I actually achieved? But is there something else going on here? Is there something positive we can learn from this for our own time and place? And needless to say, I hope there is. And it's this, that Reformation isn't just a one-off thing, but a continual thing that God must do within us. And so let's just take a minute to think about the story as a whole. The Israelites had returned from Babylon to Jerusalem. Now that was a journey of well over 1,500 miles. No cars in those days. 1,500 miles. They'd rebuilt the temple, which was burnt to the ground on its original foundations. They had restarted the worship of the temple from scratch. They had repaired the city walls with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other because of the opposition they faced. And they'd begun to put the word of God back at the heart of the community. So when you pile all those things up, it looks like they've achieved quite a lot, right? You're not impressed? Okay. But the picture we're given here at the end of the book of Nehemiah is that the fundamental disposition of the hearts of the people after exile isn't altogether different from their disposition before the exile. The exile was truly and utterly devastating, but it couldn't affect the necessary transformation of the human heart. God's people are still as faithless after exile, 
as they were before the exile. And so the book of Nehemiah finishes with the Israelites back in their ancestral home, but still in exile. Only now it's clear that their exile is about more than physical dislocation. As many of the the biblical prophets realized, the exile wasn't over simply because some of the Israelites who were taken to Babylon were now allowed to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and the walls. Rather, what they see is that exile is indicative of the entire human condition. All of us are exiles. In fact, the storyline of the whole Bible is one of exile and return. And it starts right there in Eden. It starts with Adam and Eve at home with God in the garden. It's just one condition of their life in Eden, that they're to trust and follow God. They fail. They go their own way. And so they're exiled from God's presence and sent to live as wanderers east of Eden. They're exiled. Have you, any of you, I wonder, ever returned to a place you used to live after you've spent several years away? Have you ever had that experience? If so, then I think you've probably had a similar experience to that of the Jewish people in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. You go back to somewhere you've known well, but somehow... It's just not the same. And I don't just mean that a few of the shops have changed or that a couple of the, uh, the, the, the road layouts have been slightly altered. I mean, you realise that home is more than an address. It's the time, it's the place, it's the people, it's the relationships, all of those things. You know, I know uh, just since moving back to, to Yorkshire, I've experienced that when we've gone, uh, gone over to Huddersfield, where we used to live, and uh, walked around. And the place hasn't really changed in two years. But it no longer feels like home. It's just not the same. It's familiar, but it's not home. And I think that's something of what's going on with the people here. The people had returned to Jerusalem, they'd repaired, uh, rebuilt the temple, repaired the city walls, but they still weren't at home in the land. Why? Because they were still far from God. The cloud of the glory of God's presence, the Shekinah, hadn't come to rest in the second temple as it had in the first And so what we see by the end of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah is the difference between a house and a home. A house is a matter of bricks and mortar. But a home is about what goes on inside the house. It's about the heart of the people who live there. The Israelites had rebuilt the house, Jerusalem with its temple and its walls, but it wasn't home. And the reason it wasn't truly home was because the hearts of the people hadn't fully returned to a wholehearted devotion to God. The heart of the problem was the problem of the heart. And Ezra and Nehemiah, they tried their best, but they couldn't change the hearts of the people. No leader, no leader, no matter how charismatic, how gifted they are, no leader can. As Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 both tell us, they needed God to put a new heart in them. If they were ever going to love and obey God, they would need more than outward repair, but a complete inner renovation of the heart. And so the exile of God's people in Babylon became an image of something much more universal, It served to highlight that our true exile is spiritual. It's that state of alienation and separation from God that is brought about by our determination to go it alone in life without any reference to God. And so the conclusion of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah 
isn't satisfying, not in the least. And that's the point. You can rebuild all of the outer stuff, but if you don't sort out the heart, it's worthless. It's not complete. It tells us this ending that we await our ultimate homecoming. The the 20th century German philosopher Martin Heidegger believed that all human beings are characterized by by what he called in German Unheimlichkeit, which means homesickness. We feel, he said, as if everything is at variance with our deepest desires, like we're foreigners in a country where no one speaks our language, like we're fish out of water. All of us live in an exile of our own making, and all of us seek to make homes for ourselves in exile. Some of us seek to make a home out of money. We look to money to give us that sense of security, to put the walls around us, our castle. Some of us seek to make a home out of relationships, and we look to people to love us, to make our lives feel like they have meaning and worth and value. And some of us look to religion, to morality as a home. And we try and build ourselves up and we try and go home by earning it and saying, look how good I am. And it's a great way of saying, uh, of giving up, boosting our identity by saying, look how moral and righteous I am in compared to these people down here. We all are trying to make homes for ourselves. Eva Hoffman, a Polish-Jewish intellectual whose parents were forced to flee Europe during the Holocaust, said this about exile in her memoir called Lost in Translation. She says, Since Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, is there anyone who does not feel in some way like an exile? We all feel ejected from our first homes and landscapes, from our first romance, from our authentic self. An ideal sense of belonging, of attuning with others and ourselves completely eludes us. There's an emptiness that nothing in this world can truly fill. We're homesick for a place that we've never been. And no matter where we live, or how big our house is, or how beautiful the people are that share our house, we're all ultimately homesick and longing for something more than we've ever experienced. And the homesickness we all feel has only one cure. So just listen to these uh, three different verses from the Psalms. Psalm 16, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Or these from uh, from Psalm 84, verse 10. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Or these from Psalm 90, verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Where is our home? God! Our home is God. St. Augustine of Hippo expresses it famously in his confessions as he prays, because you've made us for yourself, our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. And the hearts of the people that we see in Nehemiah 13 are restless hearts. They're still looking for home. Jerusalem was never their home. God was their home. Jerusalem was home only because God was there. That's what made it home. It's the city where God put his name. And so Ezra, Nehemiah, finishes by directing our hopes towards a king who will end our exile once and for all by bringing us home to God. Verse 
The anticlimactic ending of Ezra and Nehemiah shows that the bigger biblical storyline of exile and return waits for fulfillment. And that's where Jesus comes in. Because Jesus burst onto the scene proclaiming that the promised kingdom of God is at hand. He offers forgiveness of sins to those whose hearts are set on coming home to God. And moreover, he experiences the ultimate exile on our behalf. What do you think that cry of dereliction from the cross is? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Than a cry of an exile, of someone who's been sent out of God's presence. At the cross, Jesus experiences the ultimate spiritual exile, the complete God forsakenness of exile, so that we might never have to. The Bible opens with humans at home with God in the garden. Our rebellion leads us into an exile of our own making. And then the Bible closes in the book of Revelation with a picture of heaven on earth, joined together, of God dwelling among his people, at home with humanity once again in a garden city. That's where history is headed. And in the meantime, the New Testament writers say that we remain resident aliens. Describing and going through a long list of some of the great men and women of faith in the Bible, the author of the letter to the Hebrews says of them, they were strangers and exiles on the earth, seeking a homeland, a better country that is a heavenly one. We remain exiles, but exiles journeying on in hopeful expectation of that day when Jesus returns to transform this world into our true home by flooding it with his presence. And what that means then is that the church isn't our home. Our home is God's kingdom. Our home is where heaven, God's dimension of reality, and earth, our dimension of reality, are brought together as one. Our home is wherever and whenever what God wants done is done. Now, of course, we hope and we pray that there'll be a lot of overlap between God's kingdom and the church, increasingly so, please, God. But we mustn't get too comfortable in the church. We mustn't try to set, settle down and make the church yet another false home. We mustn't treat the church as a destination in itself. The church is not a cruise ship. Rather, it's the vehicle by which God intends to transport, towards, towards people, transport us towards our true home, which is communion with God, intimate oneness with God. God is our home, not the church. The church is the ship that he builds to get us there. And so the anticlimactic ending of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah remind us, I think, that there is no such thing as a perfect church. The home we're looking for simply cannot be found this side of the new creation. And that's not an invitation to accept mediocrity, but it is just a statement of fact. The church is to be a signpost to what it looks like to live the life of heaven on earth, but it is just a signpost, often a broken and dusty one. The church is to be a foretaste of the future heavenly banquet, but it is just a foretaste, not the whole meal. The church is to be an embassy of God's kingdom on earth, but it is just an embassy, not the entirety of God's country. Are you getting? The church is the means by which God's knowledge, the knowledge of God floods the world, but the church itself is not God. And so we can't make our home here. 
And so I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that our home is God himself. Ezra and Nehemiah poured blood and sweat and tears into their leadership. Whether all their efforts in vain? No, I don't think they were. God used them. God used their leadership to move the storyline forward, pointing ahead to Jesus. Tim Mackey of the Bible Project says this. He says, their stories give us hope and inspiration to keep pointing other people to God's grace and to keep calling them and ourselves to faithfulness and devotion. But after pondering Ezra and Nehemiah, our pointing and calling should be done with a sober awareness that our efforts will likely be compromised. This doesn't mean God isn't faithful or good. It means that we're flawed humans whose fundamentally selfish nature can be transformed only by a generous gift of God's grace. The good news for us as we seek to return and rebuild the church post-pandemic is that God doesn't expect us to build his kingdom. Rather, he asks us to work with him, with him in building his kingdom by being a beachhead, from which his life-changing power and love will go out into the world. Jesus doesn't want people to make the church their home. Jesus wants the church to lead people home. It's a dynamic picture, a picture of movement and travel. It's not a picture of settling down and making ourselves comfortable. And because the church is not our ultimate destination... That means that the church must always be reformed. That Latin motto that I've said before, I'll say it again, Ecclesia Semper Reformanda Est, the church must always be reformed. A home is a static thing. But uh, But a car driving home is constantly subject to course corrections. Some larger, some smaller, until it reaches its journey's end. I'm a huge Formula One fan, uh, and I love the uh, on, onboard uh, footage of Max Verstappen forcing Lewis Hamilton off the road, which apparently wasn't worthy of a, uh, of a penalty, but we'll gloss over that for now. But what you see in it is that he doesn't only make one course change like that, he's making several for one corner. And that's the same with us. We're constantly having to change course until we reach our journey's end. If I were wanted to go to London, if I just point my car and start driving in a straight line, I'm not going to get very far. There are lots of course adjustments that have to be made along the way. Church is changing, and that's scary. I get that. It's scary for me as well. But perhaps one of the reasons that we're scared of the change is because we've forgotten that it's not our home. It's our way home, in Jesus and to Jesus. And the ending of Ezra and Nehemiah reminds us that as the Lord's people, we're a pilgrim people. We're people of the way. That's what the first Christians are called in the book of Acts. Change will happen. Sometimes it might be a five degree change. Sometimes it might be a 20 degree change. And then there'll be more change to change the changes. And again, and a new way of church will be established. And then that will need reforming. And then the Reformation will need reforming. Until we reach home because we're not home yet that's what life on the road looks like and so the most important thing to remember is where home is where's home God and we can know him now when we're with him and we can feel at home with him even as the storms of life rage around us. But our ultimate home is that time, that place where we are with the Lord forever. 
in unbroken communion and intimacy. And so I'm convinced that there is no more important task for the church than to help people practice the presence of God. To equip the followers of Jesus to live in two places at once, with Jesus and at work. With Jesus and at home. With Jesus and with friends. Whatever we're doing with Jesus. To enjoy intimacy with him, not just on a Sunday, but every day. To live in a constant state of connectedness to him by his Holy Spirit. Friends, let's set our sails for home. The psalmist says, My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Let's pray. Lord, we want to set our sails for you. You are our home, our one true home. Lord, forgive us when we become too comfortable here. Lord, would you lead us onwards, seeing that we are people on a journey. Lord, would you make our highest priority, our one aim, to seek your face. If we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.